Moving on with the chain rule, in this example, we want to figure out where our tangent line, where our tangent line is horizontal. So we're just combining a technique that we've seen multiple times before with a new derivative technique. But again, you should be able to figure this out on your own. So here would be the time to pause the video and see what answer you come up with. Okay, so to figure out where the tangent line is horizontal, we know that we need to look at the slope, which is given by the derivative. So we need to take the derivative of this function here. We see that there is a quotient, and we see that there is a inside-outside piece. So we're going to have to combine two of our larger rules if we want to take the derivative of it in this format. Now, this is not the only format that you can use. You could also convert this into a product rule if that is something you would prefer. All you need to do is make this exponent negative to move it up to the top. Again, we still have two of our larger rules, so a product rule and a chain rule. So it's your preference which route that you want to take. I'm going to go ahead and use it in the format that I've given it to you here, but don't be afraid to try it in the other format if you prefer the product rule over the quotient rule. So my derivative in the quotient rule, and I'm going to have to do the quotient rule first before the chain rule because I do not have one major inside piece and one major outside piece. I can see that I have a separate piece between the numerator and the denominator. So my quotient rule is the original of the bottom times the derivative of the top, which gives me 2, minus the original of the top times the derivative of the bottom. And that's where I need to do my chain rule. So 3 times 1 minus 2x to the second power times the derivative of the inside, which is negative 2. So here's the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And that finishes up the top of my quotient rule where I had low d high minus high d low. And that is all over my original of the denominator squared. Now to simplify, let me rewrite this in a little bit better format. Might make this simplification a little bit easier. So I just put my coefficient out in front like we're used to seeing it. Here I can combine my number three times negative two. So that gives me a negative six. But if I put that up to this negative, that actually gives me a positive six because my double negatives cancel out. And then I have this two x plus five and this 1 minus 2x squared. And that is all over 1 minus 2x to the 6th power because we multiply our exponents here. To continue to simplify this, I want to factor between my two pieces in the numerator, so between this piece and between this piece. To figure out what we have in common, I look at 2 and 6 first. I know that there is a 2 in common. I also see that I have a 1 minus 2x in common. I can take out two of those. If I do that, that leaves me with one of these 1 minus 2x's from my first piece plus a 3 times 2x plus 5 in my second piece. And that is still all over 1 minus 2x to the sixth. So I'm going to have to simplify what's in my brackets here. But also to simplify, I can cancel out these 1 minus 2x's. I have two of them on the top, and if I take that away from the 6 on the bottom, that leaves me with 4 in the denominator. So currently, that gives me 2 times a 1 minus 2x plus 6x plus 15 just distributing this 3 through and just dropping these parentheses here over my 1 minus 2x to the fourth. Combining my terms in the numerator, 6x minus 2x gives me 4x, 
and 1 plus 15 gives me 16. And if we choose 2, we can actually factor that a little bit farther. I notice in my leftover parentheses, I have another common factor of 4. So let me pull that out, and I'm going to multiply it by this 2 here. So I take 2 times my common factor of 4 here, which gives me 8, and then that gives me x plus 4. And that is over my 1 minus 2x to the 4th. So this gives me my most simplified derivative. That was the major part of this problem. But now we know that we want to figure out where my tangent line is horizontal. And so hopefully you have this process memorized by now. Our tangent line is horizontal when our slope is equal to zero, because that's when it switches between increasing and decreasing, or decreasing and increasing. It doesn't matter which order that's happening in. So to figure out where that's happening, all we need to do is set our derivative, which we got here, equal to zero. Now, since we've done all the simplification before this, this makes our life really easy from here on out. All we have to do is one extra step. We know that we can eliminate the denominator because if I multiply it on both sides, that cancels it out. And so all we have to do is set the numerator equal to zero. We know we don't have to worry about when eight equals zero because that just doesn't work out. It just doesn't make any sense. So we only have to worry about when x plus four equals zero. So we know that our answer here is going to be when x is equal to negative 4. That's the only place in this example where our tangent line is horizontal. Now I put this exact wording in here so you can be familiar with it. It looks a little bit confusing. Find all values of x equals c so that the tangent line to the graph of our function at c f of c is horizontal. So is that asking for an x value, a c value, a value, a point, or what is it actually asking for? It's actually only asking for the x value. Find all values of x equals c. So this right here then is our final answer. If you choose to do an extra step to figure out the exact point at what this is happening, where your y value is as well, then we know that that's fairly easy. We just plug this back into our original equation. But it's not necessary, and we don't have to do it when it words the example like this. As always, I recommend that you double check your example. So I'm going to do that utilizing my graphing calculator. So pulling up my calculator here, plugging in my original equation, 2x plus 5 divided by 1 minus 2x to the third, graphing it on the standard window. And we actually don't see any max or min, which is where our tangent line is horizontal. But we came up with an answer, so let's see what's actually happening there. We can check it one of two ways. We can just look at our derivative at the answer that we found. So we can do second trace to give us the calculate feature. Option six gives us the derivative or the slope, and we can plug in our value of negative four. And this is definitely one of the places where the calculator where it tries to trick you. If you just look at it, it looks like 3.6. So you think, oh, well, we have a mistake there that we got the wrong answer. But if you look a little bit farther, it's 3.613 e to the negative 10th. That e is in scientific notation. So if I talk about 3.61 e to the negative 10th, that's like 3.61 times 10 to the negative 10th. And if I wanted to actually multiply this out, 10 to the negative 10th means I would take this decimal and I would move it to the left 10 places. So that would give me point nine zeros and then three, six, one. So this is where the calculator does that weird rounding sometimes. We can see that this is pretty consistent to be zero. So that confirms 
that we have the right place where our tangent line is horizontal. If you want to see this visually, I encourage you to zoom in on this point here. You can do that by zooming in, or you can do that by drawing a box around it, or even manually changing it if that's something that you're comfortable with. Let's go ahead and zoom in. So I'm going to do zoom, option two, zoom in, and I want to zoom in around my x equals negative four value. So I need to go all the way over to negative four. So I've moved my cursor over to negative four, and I'm going to hit enter, and this is where I'm going to zoom in at. Unfortunately, it still doesn't show us our max or our min here to confirm that this is where our tangent line should be horizontal. So let me try and manually change it from here. I can see that I have my y values going between 1 and 2, but let me zoom in quite a bit closer because all I'm seeing basically here is my x-axis. So let me go my y min really close to my x-axis, like negative 0.2. My y max, I want to do the same thing, close to my x-axis a little bit above it. And then my scale, I'm going to go by, by 0.05. And now I start to see a little bit of my minimum here. And now I see a little bit here of a dip down of my graph. So now this might confirm that I have a minimum here. If I want to see that it's happening at 4, plug in my trace and then type in negative 4 to see where that's happening at. And this does look to be at the lowest point. If you want to over confirm it, then I would encourage you to zoom in again. So let me go ahead and zoom in even farther. I'm going to do it manually. So I keep my x values the same, but I'm just going to change my y values. So notice that these tick marks go by 0.05, and I don't even come close to them. So let me make those my maximum and my minimum. And adjust my y scale accordingly. And, and so now we see a little bit more of this dip down. We see a little bit more of my minimum happening at my negative 4. And if you wanted to, you could, of course, zoom in a little bit farther. But this is where I'm going to stop on this graph. So again, in this example, we've just combined two of our things that we've already known, how to figure out where our tangent line is horizontal, and how do we use our chain rule to figure that out when we need to take the derivative.